So, uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, I think on behalf of uh, all the CISO authors, and, and as you can see, uh, there are a lot of us, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Surajit and the entire VLD Awards Committee for recognizing this paper and, and giving us this award. Uh, there are other, uh, other people we'd like to thank as well. Uh, there are sort of hundreds of employees and consultants at, at Vertica uh, that took the C-Store paper uh, and made a reality of sort of building a, a commercially viable prototype uh, with a huge amount of effort uh, and, you know, and, and difficulties along the way uh, to build it out and, uh, and, and you know, really bring it to market so that people could use it. Uh, and it really sort of multiplied the, uh, multiplied the impact that the paper was able to, 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 uh, to obtain. We'd also like to thank uh, the reviewers who accepted this paper to VLDB 2005. Uh, it was, this was not an easy paper to review. Uh, like many systems papers, uh, it discussed a bunch of components. Each one of them, maybe by themselves, were not necessarily publishable, but the, it was the combination and the interaction of the components with each other that really sort of made this paper uh, what it was um, and allowed it to have the impact that it did. But I think it wasn't so easy to review uh, 10 years ago, and so really uh, the viewers, you know, in some ways, you know, deserve uh, you know, this award along, along with the authors. Uh, for accepting the paper. Um, and uh, of course, I'd like to thank everybody who's read the paper, um, who's presented the paper in a seminar or a class, uh, people who've you know, used uh, ideas in the paper or cited the paper. I'm really, um, we're, we're, you know, genuinely we're very grateful to everybody who, uh, who helped this paper have the impact uh, that, that it did. Uh, so, uh, so just to sort of be clear, you know, the paper is called C-Store, um, but it definitely did not, you know, by no means invent uh, the idea of a column store. Uh, so there are sort of a, 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 a bunch of uh, seminal papers on this topic uh, that were published uh, before 1985. Uh, there was the, the Todd paper published in uh, 1975, uh, the Cantor paper in 1983, uh, and the DSM paper in 1985. And these are really the, uh, the seminal papers on, on the topic of column-oriented systems uh, that, you know, sort of influenced, uh, um, you know, sort of future uh, attempts at building column stores. Um, and there are many uh, real uh, uh, sort of uh, prototypes of column stores that existed uh, prior to 2005 when, when C-Store was published. Um, there was, of course, Cybris IQ, which was a, uh, a commercial implementation. Um, there was uh, um, uh, MoneyDB uh, and X100 from Cibo UI. There was PAX and uh, Faction Mirrors at Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and, and CMU also had uh, various versions of column stores. Um, so really, um, you know, th there was a bunch of, of work that influenced uh, C-Store. Um, uh, that, you know, that, that should be recognized as well. Uh, I think the main sort of contribution of, of C-Store, uh, obviously it's not the idea to, to store data in columns, uh, that was done already, but I think what C-Store did um, was it really came up with a, a practical design uh, for a, a complete uh, system uh, that, um, that sort of made C-Stores work really well. And we'll, I'll talk about a little bit what I mean uh, in a few slides. Uh, but really what C-Store did, I think, is it sort of really expanded the, uh, the application scenarios where columns or technology could be applied. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that was sort of the real essence of, of what C-Store is about. Um, so, uh, um, so, uh, so, I mean, mo I think at this point, hopefully most people, um, your database people sort of know the difference between a row store and a column store, but just very quickly for those who don't, the basic question is, you know, how do you serialize a two-dimensional relational table uh, to one-dimensional disk? You do, it, do you do it row by row or do you do it column by column? Uh, so, you know, the vast majority of, of systems, you know, uh, pre-2005, uh, they did it row by row. Um, and the reason is that it really makes it easy to add um, or read records. If you want to add a single record or if you want to read a single record, you can do that in a single read or write to disk. Uh, and that's sort of the real, you know, that's the real advantage. Uh, but the downside is, you know, because of the way, so the, the granularity with which we read data from storage in, in, your, in, in blocks, uh, if, you want, if you have a query that's sort of accessed, you know, some subset of the columns in a table, uh, that uh, um, you end up having to read in the surrounding attributes as well, just because we just read data in blocks. Uh, so you end up sort of wasting, you know, bandwidth uh, to disk or, or whatever storage you have, um, uh, reading it from, uh, reading these, these sort of irrelevant attributes for a particular query. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, that's, you know, row storage, column storage, like, you know, the real advantage of column storage is that if you have, if you have a query that accesses only three columns uh, out of 100 or 200, uh, then you really only have to read in those three columns from disk. So you really sort of, you, you're much more efficient with respect to, uh, to disk bandwidth or, or storage bandwidth or whatever you're using uh, when, you read in, uh, read, when you read in those three columns uh, from storage. However, there are a bunch of disadvantages, uh, and these disadvantages really sort of held back column stores from, from proliferating uh, prior to 2005. Uh, one of them was if, you know, you do have to, you know, the, the interface to database systems is still rows, right? So, you know, the select clause of a SQL query, you know, sort of requires us to sort of stitch these columns eventually into rows to, to present to the end user. Um, and so this process of constructing tuples from the columns, you know, that's a non-trivial non cost, um, and you have to pay that cost at some point over the course of query processing. 
And the other disadvantage of column stores um, is if you want to write a single tuple to, uh, to your column store, uh, well, you have to break it up into pieces right, by attribute and store each, each attribute you know, in, a, in a different write, uh, each attribute uh, uh, separately. Um, so these two things, really the, um, the tuple reconstruction cost uh, and the, uh, the write cost are, are really sort of um, uh, the main sort of uh, uh, disadvantage of column stores and, and, and prevented them from really sort of dominating the world uh, prior to 2005. Um, so, uh, so she sort of a few things to sort of alleviate the disadvantages and really sort of make column stores uh, sort of work really well. Um, so, you know, so one of them, of course, is, is uh, in the solution to, uh, to, to a lot of problems in computer science is batching and amortization, and, uh, and that's what C-Store did. Um, so the, the essence of C-Store was a read optimized store, uh, which was basically read-only. Um, so a bunch of columns, you're dense packed on disk uh, that, uh, that you wouldn't really touch. And if you wanted to write a new record, what you would do in C-Store, uh, you, was, you would, it would go to a, diff a completely different store, write optimized store, uh, that was you know, stored entirely in memory, uh, was unsorted, uncompressed, um, and therefore was able to achieve uh, very low latency in, uh, in, uh, in writing data to, to that write optimized store. Um, and so that's, you know, that really sort of gets around this problem of writes to column stores, right? The writes just go to a different store, which is optimized for writes. And then what happened was there was a background process, a tuple mover process, that asynchronously uh, moved data from this write optimized store to the write optimized store and wrote it in batch, therefore amortizing the cost of these individual writes to these individual columns. Um, so that was, you know, sort of one uh, key, key feature of, of C-Store. Another one uh, was compression. Um, so, you know, C-Store really um, sort of uh, uh spent a lot of time sort of uh, thinking about how can we leverage compression in the context of column store systems. You know, in general, column stores, you have more data locality, that there's more data similarity in columns than it rows, uh, so you end up sort of being able to uh, take advantage of different techniques and, or, or even the same techniques, but just do it better uh, in column stores than you could in row stores. Um, so you know, one thing the C-Store was known for was having sort of multiple materialized views um, where, uh, and it would sort of, um, you know, uh, each view would sort of generally have you know, a different sort order. Um, and, and so that, that sort of allowed us to sort of to find columns uh, which are particularly, uh, particularly uh, amenable to sorting and compress compressing after sorting. So for example, let's say we're a retail company shown here. Uh, um, we have, uh, you know, say, you know, uh, uh, the quarter the product was sold in, the day was sold in within the quarter, the product itself or the category and, you know, the price, you know, for example. Uh, so, you know, if one of the materialized views, we, we call them projections in C-Stores, if one of these materialized views uh, sorted the data uh, by quarter, um, uh, then uh, since quarter had a, a small number of unique attributes, uh, uh, unique values, i.e. had uh, low cardinality, um, you know, if you sort by it, you end up having a lot of runs of the same value in a row. Uh, and so in, in a row store, you can't really take advantage of that, but in a column store because all the, that, the whole run of values are all stored consecutively in disk, uh, you can use uh, you know, techniques like run-length encoding, uh, which takes these very long runs of values and shrinks them down to, to, to its bare minimum. Right? So for example, you see here, this quarter column, which was you know, uh, originally 1,700 attributes, uh, 1,700 values um, uh, in, you know, in the uncompressed data in this example, you know, went down to sort of just, um, I'm showing you 12 values, really it can be done in eight values um, uh, as, um, after, after compression. And since there's so many runs of the same value in the quarter, you can even secondarily sort the data by, by day and, and run a thing called the day column as well, which you see here at the bottom. Um, and then, you know, for other columns, we could use, you know, standard techniques like dictionary and, and compression, but expanding symbols to, to span multiple values. Um, or we also had this technique called bit vector en uh, encoding, where you'd have uh, a different bit vector for, uh, for each unique value of a particular column, where the ith value in the bit vector is set to one if the ith value in the column uh, is equal to the value associated with that bit vector. Um, you know, integers, can, they can be uh, integer encoded. Um, you know, you can use things like delta encoding um, uh, to compress them down as well. Um, so, uh, so, you know, so, but the, th the thing with compression, the real advantage of compression, of course, is that, you know, it makes data smaller, which is nice, but it also reduces the time uh, with which it takes to read it off disk. So if you're, re if you're doing long scans, which are very common in, uh, in sort of uh, analytical workloads, um, if you have less data to read, uh, you can get those queries to go much faster. But the key, I think, you know, sort of the key uh, uh, thing that we did in C-Store beyond just compression was that we uh, really, we used sort of lighter weight compression schemes that were very much amenable to direct operation on it directly. Therefore, sort of allowing us to not only read in less data, but never having to decompress it at all. So for example, if we, ha if we have this uh, query shown here, where we want to sort of read uh, the, uh, uh, if you want to figure out how many uh, products was, you know, of each product, how many of them were sold in, uh, in the second quarter of, of this particular company, um, well, we can do this uh, selection predicate quarter equals Q2, but directly on the run of thing called data, we can sort of skip directly to Q2. We can see that uh, values uh, not, uh, between 301 and 306 uh, match this particular predicate. 
And then let's say the product ID column uh, is bit vector encoded. Uh, all we have to do is just uh, you know, skip to 301st to 306th bits in, in each of the bit vectors um, and count the ones, right? And so we're able to answer this query entirely without ever having to decompress the quarter column or the product ID column. Uh, so, uh, so really, I think operation, on direct, operation directly on, direct on compressed data um, was a, a key a component of CSTOR's uh, good performance. Another key component is uh, late materialization. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, you know, so the obvious thing with column store is, well, you only have to read it in the relevant data from disk, that's great. Um, but you know, if you just stop there, you lose a lot of potential for performance. Uh, so shown here on the left of the screen um, is what you do if you do it that way, right? So you read, let's say we have this, this query shown on the top of the screen, it accesses four columns. Uh, so we read in those four columns on, on the left over here from disk. If we construct the rows immediately from them and just use a regular, query, uh, a regular uh, row oriented uh, query processor from that point, uh, then, uh, then you get the benefit of only, only having to read those four columns from disk, but that's it. That's the only benefit you get. Uh, whereas uh, what we did in C-Store um, is we sort of uh, we used uh, a technique called late materialization, where we kept data in columns all the way through query processing. Uh, so the select operator would work in columns, the aggregation operator would work in columns, and only at the very end of the query uh, would we construct rows um, uh, to return to the user. Um, and that allowed us to sort of construct way fewer tuples, because in general, the output is usually much smaller than the input uh, to any query. Um, so uh, there, there was much less uh, tuple construction happening overall. Um, we even were able to further limit, uh, when we did have to decompress, they would limit the decompression we'd, we'd have to do. Um, and also that allows us to better utilize memory, memory bandwidth. Um, so, I mean, there are a bunch of other techniques as well that we use in C-Store. We don't have time to go through all of them in, um, in, in the short talk. Uh, but the, the basic point I want to show you um, is, that, um, is that these things really matter, right? So uh, the regular vanilla column store that only reads in the right columns from disk, is, uh, the performance of that on, on this benchmark, the SSBM uh, benchmark, uh, you know, we found that the average query was 40 seconds, shown here on the right. But when you add late materialization, all of a sudden you get down average to 10, uh, to 10 seconds. When you add compression and operation direction compressed data, it gets down to, to around eight seconds. And when you added this column multi-join algorithm, which we didn't have time to talk about today, uh, we're down to four seconds. So you end up getting an order of magnitude uh, performance difference uh, between a vanilla column store and a good column store. Um, so I think I'll, um, uh, um, I think I'll stop here as far as discussion C store, and then you know obviously C store was commercialized uh, by a company called Vertica, um, and uh, um, uh, and you know really Mike Stonebaker was the one who founded uh, Vertica um, and really made it happen and made it successful. And so uh, Mike will uh, take over now and talk about about Vertica and, and what's next for uh, for analytical data processing. Thanks, Dan. Uh, but I think the, if you back up to 100,000 feet, there, there are exactly two things that made column stores work. And I got to thank an unnamed marketing guy whose name I can't remember for telling me these two things. Uh, most of you know about fact tables, star schemas, snowflake schemas. This is the standard way that warehouses are constructed. The key thing is that in the real world, fact tables are very fat. You know, that, that's, you're recording facts about typically transactions and you record 100 fields. So the average data warehouse has a very wide fact table. Second key point is that the average query reads four of these 100 attributes and the other 96 don't get touched. And in a data warehouse, the four that you read the next query reads some other four, so that there isn't any locality on, on the attributes you read, and you read a small number out of a big number of columns. So it, it's now a no-brainer to realize that column stores are a really good idea, and, uh, and that's what we did. Now what happened was that the data warehouse market, in fact, has customers have those two characteristics, which means that uh, when a commercial column store appeared, uh, it put a lot of angst into the existing vendors. And I think the reason this paper you know, is important is that if you look at the commercial marketplace in the last decade, in the data warehouse world, it's flipped completely from being a row store world to a column store world. The only successful data warehouse products going forward are going to be column stores. And that's the commercial marketplace has realized that. IBM has a system called Blue, written since 2006. 
essentially has completely replaced you know, DB2 parallel edition uh, in the warehouse world. Uh, ditto for Microsoft. Uh, Oracle is the only company which doesn't really have a column store. Even though they claim they have one, it's not really a column store in the vertica sense of the world word. Uh, and so, and the new vendors have all implemented column stores, uh, you know, since 2006. So that this in this this in this single slide is the reason that uh, C store is important. By and large, all the new vendors are implementing roughly the C store architecture. You know, everyone has a log structured merge tree for column stores. Uh, if you want, if you don't want to store data in entry sequence, you need to have a main memory uh, store in front of this LSM tree, or inserts are too expensive. So pretty much we got it right, and pretty much the, ver the commercial marketplace has said yes, we agree. However, why won't this advance? However, this is all yesterday's news. Uh, so this is all data warehouses, business intelligence, SQL aggregates on, on star schemas. That's, that's business intelligence. I'll call that stupid analytics. And it's definitely yesterday's news. The coming world is going to be data science. Absolutely, everybody agrees with that. And it's going to be a much different set of analytics. So what are these analytics going to look like? Uh, to a first approximation, it's linear algebra. And it's linear algebra on arrays. And the codes people write, the, the inner loop, there's a small number of inner loops, matrix multiply, singular value decomposition, principal component analysis, a bunch of others. Uh, why, if you don't believe me, let's go through a really simple example. Uh, suppose you're a quant on Wall Street, and you've got the closing price uh, for all, tr uh, all trading days for the last five years. It's a couple thousand uh, days for two stocks, A and B. And if you want to do electronic trading, the simplest thing to do is to say, are, the, are these two time series correlated? So the red stuff is the covariance between these two time series. And if two stocks are highly correlated, then if one goes up, you probably want to buy the other. If one goes down, you probably want to short the other. Well, anybody who does it for dollars wants to do it for all the stocks on the NYSE, or all, this, all the US publicly traded stocks, or all stocks in the world. So you can make this get big pretty quickly. But anyway, if you want to do all pairs covariance for the 4,000 NYSE stocks, uh, you've got the stocks going vertically, you've got the trading days going horizontally, and you've got that red matrix. And what is covariance? It's basically, without, you know, without worrying about the constants, it's that red matrix times matrix multiply its transpose. So that's effectively what you have to compute. And smart analytics is this kind of stuff. And whether you're talking uh, machine learning, whether you're talking dot, 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 it's all this kind of stuff. So smart, this is the coming world of what we're going to have to deal with. Uh, business intelligence is going to go away. Data scientists want to do this stuff. Uh, what does an actual data scientist do uh, after he gets done sort of loading his data, which is a big problem? Uh, he does a loop of, uh, well, I'd like to do an all pairs covariance for those stocks who are headquartered uh, in the Northeast. So then he does an all pairs covariance. Well, that wasn't very interesting. Let's try it for all stocks with a market cap less, less than a billion dollars. So it's this iterative loop of data management and analytics. So you clearly want to tightly couple your analytics uh, with your data management in the same way that SQL aggregates are tightly coupled into a SQL executor. So how to do this 
Uh, well, it seems like there's only going to be two games in town. Okay, cool. I'll have a couple more slides. So there's only two games in town. Either this is array calculation, so you either have an array database system, which I think I'm a big fan of, or you're going to try and make uh, Vertica et al. work on this kind of stuff. So you either run a column store, and you, you're now going to have to tightly embed uh, matrix operations into a column store, uh, or you're going to use an array database system. In my opinion, arrays have an, an array database system has an unfair advantage in the same way that a column store has an unfair advantage over a row store, which is an array, the data is already an array, and you don't have to cast a table to an array, and that's kind of a painful n squared operation. So in my opinion, arrays, I think, are, are a great solution to this problem. And in any case, whether you're going to do this in a column store or in an array database system, you've got to have very careful and tight integration, which is going to be a lot of tricky engineering. Just for example, uh, if, you're, if you look at something like Scalapack, which is sort of a state-of-the-art uh, matrix uh, linear algebra package, uh, it runs over n nodes, and it does what's called block cyclic allocation. And no database system does block cyclic allocation. And so the matrix guys want different layouts than we want, and dot, 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 dot. So there's a whole bunch of careful integration that's in our future. Linear algebra is hard, and I didn't think it was, but sparse algorithms are very different than dense algorithms, and if you have sparse uh, arrays, uh, you need sparse linear algebra. If you have dense arrays, you need dense linear algebra. You need both of them. You've got to be very careful how you implement matrix multiply and the other inner loop operations. Uh, just for example, uh, we had some smart Russians implement l linear algebra in C, and they were in, it was an order of magnitude slower than in, Intel's MKL, which is to say if you have the hardware guys down in the weeds doing vector pipelining, you get an order of magnitude. So you've got to focus carefully on the inner loop of all this stuff, or you're not going to run well. I don't know what this slide is. <laughs> anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much. So if you look at today's, so I think everything, Mike, uh, uh, you have said uh, is uh, true. But if you look at today's enterprise for the next three to four years on the data on which they act on, you know, uh, it seems to me that they go through an immense amount of pivoting and unpivoting early on through a whole process. And, the, and to support the ad hoc data mining, that's very tightly integrated. So you'll sort of recast the areas in very different ways if you want to have performance. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on it. The second aspect, it seems to me when I even talk to, I'm not an ML expert, obviously, but when I talk to the ML folks uh, within Microsoft Research and elsewhere, it seems to me for many enterprises on a single server machine, as of 2015, of course, uh, you can do these machine learning models. Looking ahead, of course, as they want to change the models too frequently, of course, there is a you know, distributed systems question. So I just wanted to your thoughts on these two points. Well, I think, uh, no, number one, uh, if, you don't, if you don't want to do this stuff at scale, it's trivial. So if, if it fits in main memory on one machine, it goes blindingly fast. And I think, uh, and so there's a class of problems that, that are going to be small enough that they're, they're easy. Uh, there's another class of problems where you can sample and knock it down to something that's easy. However, you talked about data mining. The key thing about data mining is that most everybody is looking for rare events. And rare events are not going to get found by sampling. You're going to have to do the whole enchilada. 
And so uh, just, like, just like in data warehousing, if you want to, if your database is a megabyte, you know, do data warehousing on your cell phone. Uh, but the people with petabyte problems really have, be have big problems. The same thing's going to be true here. And so I think it's, it, it's hard at scale. It's very hard to make this stuff work in parallel uh, fast. And I think it, it's a completely open research problem. Uh, what, what, are the inner, what are the inner loop operations that you want to focus on? You know, Chris has different ideas than, than I have. Uh, how, how are you going to integrate this into data management tightly and efficiently? I think it's just it's pretty much an open research area in the same way that how to build column stores was an open research area 10 years ago. Thanks, Mike, and uh, Dan, Mike, Sam, and everyone else, congratulations again. Congrats, guys, on the award. Uh, following up on this question and your reaction, Mike, um, there are systems like System ML that are doing the kinds of parallelization. I mean, our guys, I didn't have anything to do with it, <laughs> have worked on doing to these sorts of problems the same sort of stuff that was done years ago in regular SQL with parallel database systems. So I don't think it's as much of an open thing as uh, you made it sound. But, but What's you, your reaction? But you got to integrate it with data management tightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is like a full-blown database system with automatic parallelization and control over degree of parallelization and such things. So these are being done. I mean, it's not like it's far out into the future is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I think, and I think it's going to take, you know, somewhere between half a decade and a decade before there are enough trained data scientists to, to act, actually do this stuff in practice. So I think the, the market will be gated by universities training data scientists. So we've got a few years to figure this stuff out. <laughs>